Your Excellency, the Secretary General of OPEC. He's got a tough year ahead. Sir. How are you? Thank you so much. Settle in, Secretary General. We've got 20 minutes. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Hopefully not too bumpy. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Happy New Year. Good Happy New Year, sir. Good to see you, Manus. Uh, His Excellency. Happy New Year. Al Happy New Year. His Excellency Al Masri, I think, summed it up beautifully. Um, the world cannot sustain a $100 price of oil and certainly can't endure another war. My question to you, as you deal with world leaders on a fairly regular basis, how do we de-escalate the current tensions that are at play between Iran and the United States of America? Uh, thank you very much. I almost uh, uh, could predict that uh, Manus uh, will shoot this uh, first question uh, to me. Uh, poor me, I'm only dealing in the supply and demand balances of oil and stock levels and issues of climate change like we've had from Fatima. But I can tell you that uh, discussing with my brother Suhail this morning when I woke up and saw the news, um, we remain confident that the leaders, our leaders in particular in this region, uh, are currently doing everything possible uh, to restore normalcy, to arrest the situation before it spirals out of control. And I just want to use the opportunity you are giving me by asking this question uh, to respectfully urge all world leaders across the regions to rally around and support the noble efforts of the leaders in this region who have embarked on these uh, initiatives uh, to restore normalcy. We in OPEC, in the last 60 years, we have faced uh, several challenges, including wars, invasions, six oil cycles. And each time we try to insulate ourselves from the geopolitics and depoliticize this beautiful resource, oil. And I believe we're going to continue uh, to do this in order to remain reliable, dependable suppliers to consuming nations such as Bangladesh, India, China, many other emerging markets, and to ensure that this beautiful resource remains competitive in the energy transition. Can I ask you, if, if I look at the market, and Sean and I were chatting about this before we started, which is to contextualize the past six months. It is not an incident of splendid isolation, as Disraeli once said, that has happened overnight. It is an amalgam of six months of angst in the market. Are you surprised that the market has been, I suppose, relatively, relatively calm in the face of such geopolitical angst? I believe in the last three years, the market and the financial markets in particular have come to accept, acknowledge, and accept the declaration of cooperation of 24 producing countries, the first time in history, uh, to come together to take decisions jointly, to implement them jointly in order to ensure sustainable stability in the oil market. We have seen in September the unfortunate events mm -hmm. in Kuwait and Al Baik in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where 5% or so uh, of world supply uh, was shut out. And is that what we need to remember that yeah. OPEC Plus, can I use the phrase, stands ready to do whatever it takes if there is an outage? Is that the consensus that the market needs to understand from you this morning? It is not about outage, it's not about slogans, it's about facing reality. It's about facing the situation of uncertainty. And in this world of today, where the only thing that is certain is this uncertainty, the world should commend these 24 countries, diverse as they are, 
coming together to work together to ensure the stability, to ensure the security of supply to consuming nations. And we have tested this mechanism in the last three years. We have adjusted, we have recalibrated the mechanism, and it has worked so far. You have seen the averages in 2017, 2018, 2019, and the multiply effect on the global economy. So I think there is this acceptance that so long as this mechanism is in place, so long as this framework is working, and the participants are sh continuously showing their commitment, you have seen the numbers going up 146% compliance in 2019 by all the parties together. I think this has, to a large degree, reassured the market. So although we continue to see this volatility, but they come back to the fundamentals. And that fundamental asked. is about control. Yes. It, and, and is that the point that you want to make about compliance? So the latest number for the whole of 2019 was 146 percent. What was December? How's, how's, the new, how's the new compliance looking then? Yeah, we, 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 we are still looking at the preliminary numbers uh, for December. These numbers will be uh, released in a couple of days' time. But all I can tell you at the moment, the preliminary numbers are looking even much better uh, on monthly monthly basis. So the message here is that these countries, despite their diversities, despite their various interests, big and small, mm -hmm. together they have been able to stick together. They have been able to overcome these market challenges that have become almost routine uh, today. Have you spoken to Prince Abdulaziz? We're waiting. One, one of the big concerns for the world is oil security. Aramco took that hit. It is now a publicly listed company. Have you spoken to the prince? And what was the, what, what, what's the general sense from the Saudis at this stage? We have heard several times, including from Prince Abdulaziz uh, bin Salman, uh, the current energy minister, that the listing of a part of Aramco uh, will in no way affect the ro leading role of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia within OPEC and the OPEC Plus. And they have demonstrated that, including on the 5th and the 6th of December, when he led in the uh, decision making uh, that had turned out to be a savior for the market, which we are now seeing that in Q1 and Q2, uh, the market is much more comfortable uh, with the decisions that we had taken. So there's no cause for alarm. The additional agreement in December from the Saudis for the marketplace is an additional level of work done by the Saudis contingent, expressly contingent on Nigeria and Iraq complying. So. Is that all going according to plan? Are, are, are the two things in syncopation? If I take the geopolitics, and, and as you say, we've, we've, we've weathered a lot, so the Saudis will cut an additional 400,000 barrels if Nigeria and Iraq are on track. So talk me through that. It was a collective decision on the 5th and the 6th of December to raise the level of adjustments from 1.2 to 1.7. However, in demonstrating the continued leadership of the kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, Prince Abdulaziz had pledged to continue his voluntary over compliance, if you like, to the tune of about 400,000, which brings the total to about 2.1 million barrels a day. If all participating countries will fully and on a timely basis continue to comply uh, with their adjustment obligations. So it applies to everybody. So what we are working on now is how we can assist all countries to raise their level of conformity to 
uh, so that we'll continue to give comfort uh, to the kingdom that they would be able to uh, continue to play this noble role that they are playing. Well, Iraq and Nigeria are core there. Do you think, given the geopolitical disruption that we're seeing at the moment, the, the actual real disruption that we're seeing at the moment inside Iraq, will they be afforded latitude of time to comply? I think it's very premature. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a big relief that the facilities uh, continue to be secured in Iraq. Uh, their production is continuing uh, unaffected. And Samir Gadban had, the minister had pledged here in Abu Dhabi in <coughs> September, a gradual ramp up of his level of compliance. And this he has demonstrated. So we are optimistic that in the course of time, they will be able to hit the 100% mark. The <coughs> world is trying to assess the, the response mechanism from Iran. We've seen some action overnight. But the world is concerned about the Straits of Hormuz. His Excellency al Masri just said there, look, the whole world will be affected if anything happens in the Straits of Hormuz. But it's our supply, GCC supply, is where the spare capacity lies. So this is a, a real risk in your eyes in terms of is it tanker attacks, is it the Straits of Hormuz, or is it more facility attacks? The conversations that you've had, what are people most concerned about? The issue of spare capacity is, is a function of investment in the industry. We have seen 2015, 2016, an unprecedented sharp contraction in investments by a cumulative 50% or so as a result of the downturn. In 2017, we only saw about 3% uptick in investments. In 2018, the numbers are looking around 7%. 2019, the jury is still out. So, yes, the issue of spare capacity will come to the fore if there's a risk to security of supply. What we should focus upon, including here in this forum, is how do we overcome the challenge of investment? Already, we are behind in terms of the numbers and the continuous forward curve is looking at slower, slower growth. It is in the interest of the global economy for this industry to continue to attract predictable investments that would not only maintain the current supply to meet the current demand, but also to meet the growing demand and unforeseen circumstances which nobody can predict. Let's just dig a little bit deeper into the global demand side because the trade deal and geopolitics are both up there on the screen that Sean put up as, as being the biggest challenge for us. Um, how does the demand side look from, from where your conversations stand at the moment as we start 2020? The demand side of the equation has been of concern to us mm. way back in July last year when we decided to uh, continue the adjustments of 1.2 million right up to the first quarter of this year. We had seen revisions in terms of the GDP growth numbers globally from many reputable institutions, including Bloomberg. Uh, we have also seen a corresponding revisions from demand. Uh, uh, across the board. Uh, you have just reported uh, this morning the softening of demand in India, uh, uh, for example. Now, in respect of these revisions, mm -hmm. we have been able to recalibrate our supply adjustments. We have also realigned our demand numbers they are basically around 1 million, 
which we cannot raise any alarm over that. I think one million, as Suhail has just mentioned yes. here, uh, is not robust, but it is also not alarming. Okay, so if it's not robust and it's not alarming, I mean, it's the classic sort of OPEC plus question, which is, so should we expect a rollover of the deal at the current agreement that we had in December? Is that, is that what you're lobbying for? And what kind of response no. have you got to that? I know that we're all politic. In, 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 in December, we focused on the first two quarters, Q1 and Q2. Yep. In Q1, our projections showed an oversupplied market of about 700,000 barrels. Mm -hmm. In Q2, it's about 900,000. And our permutations showed that an additional adjustment of 500 over the 1.2 will almost keep the market in check. Uh, in the second half of the year, uh, the Well, almost isn't going to be good enough, Secretary General, is the, it? The focus at the moment is showing a growth in, in, in demand. So we are just a few days into January. Mm -hmm. uh, the additional 500 just kicked in a couple of days ago. But I can tell you, talking to uh, many, many ministers uh, 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 during the holidays, everybody is trying to adjust their supply uh, arrangements to be able to meet their additional adjustments. Uh, there is a renewed vigor, if you like, because the numbers are very clear. The decisions are data-driven. Uh, and the countries that have been lagging behind, for example, for domestic internal reasons, are now working round the clock to over overcome these challenges. A conversation would never be complete, Your Excellency, without a message for the President of the United States of America. Some people are saying to me, he is totally unpredictable. Your message to the President, sir, this morning. We uh, welcome the continued role of Shell Oil from the United States. We welcome the new status of the United States being the biggest producer uh, of not only crude oil, but liquids. With that comes responsibility to maintain stable oil markets that is good for the United States, that is good for the producing companies in the United States, that is good for the consumers in the United States, is a shared responsibility. OPEC alone cannot shoulder that responsibility. We invite the United States to join us in this noble role and objective. Secretary General of OPEC, Mohamed Bakindo, thank you very much for joining us here today, sir. Thank you. Thank you.